Good afternoon. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Chowley Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm really excited that today we're joined by Professor Glenn Lowry from Brown University. Glenn Lowry has done a wide variety of academic research in economics, ranging from natural resource economics to microeconomic theory to race and inequality. And he's also an outstanding public intellectual as well, including having his own podcast, The Glenn Show. I'm a huge fan of Glenn Lowry, super honored and excited to be able to talk to Glenn Lowry today. We have a good crowd uh, up in the Louise today, and in the Louise, you'll get a chance to ask your own questions of Glenn Lowry after, after our interview. So please get your questions ready and go up to the podium at the end to ask your questions. And if you're watching on Zoom, please submit your questions through the Q&A &E, Q &A feature of Zoom. Glenn C. Lowry is the Mertens P. Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences and Professor of Economics at Brown University. As an academic economist, Professor Lowry has published mainly in the areas of applied microeconomic theory, game theory, industrial organization, natural resource economics, and the economics of race and inequality. As a prominent social critic and public intellectual, writing mainly on the themes of racial inequality and social policy, he has published over 200 essays and reviews in journals of public affairs in the United States and abroad. He has received numerous awards and held several prestigious leadership positions. He's also author of four books and host of The Glenn Show. And I also know that he has a memoir uh, coming out very soon. My last uh, understanding was that I was at the publisher, so I'm excited and I'm gonna ask questions about that as well later. So, so thanks to the Menard family and to all of our donors for making this series possible. And thank you, Glenn Lowry, for being here today and welcome. Thank you very much, John. I'm happy to be with you. Yeah, and I, and as I was saying um, before uh, we were online here, uh, I think you made a good choice not to come to Fargo in February. L last week we were postponed because of a blizzard, and we have a blizzard starting at six o'clock tonight. Uh, but I hope that you come here in the future. We'll invite you maybe in a warmer month than February, because February is not the most appealing month in in Fargo. I agree with you. Um, and so anyway, so thanks again. And I'd, I'd like to start out by asking some questions. You have a very interesting background. And so I'd like to, if it's okay with you, start asking some questions about your background. Okay. So starting out, um, I know you uh, born in 1948 and grew up in Chicago in the 1950s and 1960s. So could you talk a little bit about what was it like to grow up in Chicago at that time? Oh, it was a different world uh, a long time ago. Um, I'm uh, black, as you can see. I grew up on the south side of the city in a predominantly black uh, working class, lower middle class neighborhood. Uh, it wasn't uh, like uh, Chicago uh, in those neighborhoods is today. The issues of crime and violence were not nearly as pressing. Um, it was a community of people striving to make their way in America. Uh, second generation immigrants, you could call them because they had, uh, the families had come up from the south of the United States in the years after the First World War, and then again in surges after the Second World War. Um, I went to public schools and uh, got a reasonably good education in Chicago public schools through high school. Uh, this was uh, by the time I was in my adolescent years, the 1960s, the economy was going pretty strong. The Vietnam War had started up. Uh, there was radicalism in, in the air. Um, so it, it was a different time. Uh, I'm happy to respond to more specifically, but that's that's my overview. Yeah, so, so I know that you were, uh, you were, your teachers and your peers recognized that you were really good at math at, at a very young age. Um, and I know that you went to, ended up uh, going to Northwestern and you got a degree in math. And so could you just talk a little bit about your journey to, to studying math at Northwestern University? Well, sure. I mean, I, I was good at math as a kid. Um, I had a slide rule that I loved to play with. I was learning about tables of logarithms when I was in the seventh grade and things like that. 
Uh, and as I say, got a reasonably good education in the public high school, uh, had a wonderful solid geometry and trigonometry and pre-calculus uh, teachers in high school. Um, I spent uh, the first uh, part of my college career at the Illinois Institute of Technology. That's where I went right after graduating high school. I was 16 years old. And I wasn't really mature in my outlook toward life. And I was also, uh, you know, my girlfriend got pregnant and I ended up dropping out of college and not completing a degree at the IIT. Uh, I went to work uh, to support my uh, young family and uh, took classes at a community college. Uh, in, uh, uh, in Chicago, uh, where I was trying to get myself back on track for my education, uh, but working full time and, and with a wife and a kid and then a, a, another kid. So by the time you get to the late 1960s, 1968, 1969, I'm a college dropout. I'm a full time employee at the R.R. Donnelly and Sons printing plant uh, on the lake front in Chicago. Um, and I'm I'm uh, a, a young father and a husband and uh, taking classes at the community college. I had a teacher there at the community college. His name was Mr. Riffels. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. His name was Mr. Andros. <laughs> Mr. Andros, uh, who was different from Mr. Riffels. He was one of my high school teachers. But anyway, Mr. Andros said, hey, you're really, he was teaching calculus. And he said, hey, you're really good at this. And he was an uh, alum of Northwestern, uh, retired engineer, and uh, teaching calculus in this community college. Uh, and he said, you know, they've, they've been sending a flyer around telling me that if I had any promising young students who might do well uh, here, that they'd be willing to consider offering a scholarship. You should go and talk to them. Here's a number I want you to call. And I called and I got interviewed and uh, my test scores were pretty good. My uh, academic transcript was somewhat checkered because I had dropped out, but my test scores were pretty strong and Northwestern offered me a full scholarship to come and study there. Long story, the short version is I got to Northwestern and it was like a whole new world opening up to me. And for the first time, I was really serious about my college studies, even though I was working a full-time job at the same time. Uh, and I started taking economics and philosophy and mathematics. I was a math major, an economics minor. I took a lot of philosophy courses and uh, I took courses in German language and literature. That was pretty much my, my curriculum at Northwestern. And uh, in two and a half years, two years in the summer in between, um, I made the dean's list every uh, trimester and I, I did well. I was taking graduate level math and econ courses by the time I was in my senior year at Northwestern. And in 1972, I left there with a BA in mathematics on my way to MIT. Well, that, that's phenomenal. So, so how did you do it? I mean, like how, how in the world did you support a family, work full time, go to Northwestern, do so well, graduate in such a short amount of time? Yeah, it does seem pretty miraculous when you think about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, a lot of coffee, you know, sleep going out on four or five hours sleep a night, working the second shift from four till midnight and then going to class during the day or working the third shift from midnight until eight and then getting to class in the morning after work. Uh, didn't see much of my kids, you know, uh, weekends and such. Uh, it, it was definitely a tough, uh, a tough period. But uh, I was in love with what I was doing. I was 22 years old, you know? I mean, I, it was, it was uh, a different phase in my life. And I, and I was keen to show my father, who was really annoyed with me for, you know, messing up my life as he saw it. I wanted to show him I was worth a damn, you know, that I really wasn't uh, the, the uh, deadbeat that he, seem to be thinking that I was. I wanted to prove to my father that, that, that I, you know, I, I was a good man. That was part of my inspiration anyway. Well, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask questions about your book later, but I'm assuming that's part of your autobiography because that's a really, that's an inspirational, you know, success story that it's good for people to, to hear that. Uh, I, we had a, one, one of our speakers that we had in the fall for the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series was Sam Peltzman from University of Chicago. 
And he was talking about Milton Friedman, his relationship with Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman was a very unique individual that a very accomplished academic economist, but also an outstanding public intellectual. And I think a lot of the people that know, knew him as a public intellectual weren't aware of the depth of the work he did as an academic economist. You're very similar that a very you're a very accomplished academic economist, also an outstanding public intellectual. And I think a lot of the people that know you as a public intellectual aren't aware of the depth of the work that you've done as an economist. And I've gone through your Google Scholar page and seen publishing in the top journals, ton of publications, a ton of citations, very impressive. Um, right. And I'm wondering what, what was it that attracted you to the public intellectual route when clearly you're already very successful as an academic economist, including, and which is a, something that most academics don't do is hosting your own podcast and you're very good at it. So what made you want to do that? Oh, you know, you're the second person in a week to compare me to Milton Friedman. And it really is making me nervous because Milton <laughs> Friedman was a great, great man uh, as a towering figure in, in macroeconomics and monetary uh, theory, as you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, I mean, he was just an epic uh, 20th century economist, Milton Friedman. So I do not deserve to be mentioned in the same sentence with Milton Friedman. This one, it was a, a fundraiser kind of event for these uh, guys from Stanford, Scott Atlas and, and uh, Josh Rao, uh, who are Hoover Institution scholars and uh, Stanford faculty members. And uh, they they had a Palm Beach uh, gathering and and uh, uh, the uh, what do they call it the Global Liberty Institute is a new uh, initiative that they've launched and they asked me to come down and be a part of that. But anyway, I was being introduced and the uh, uh, <laughs> Josh says uh, Glenn Lowry like Milton Friedman and I it, it chills up my spine really. Uh, but I'll answer your question. Uh, so, you know, I came out of MIT, I was a student of Bob Solo, uh, Peter Diamond was the second on my committee, and I was just interested in doing this uh, thing that I thought was so beautiful, which was writing down models that captured the essence of some kind of important economic interaction and try to clarify it, you know, try to get it, you know, get everything, what causes what and what are the incentives and what's the information and what's the structure of the interaction and what's the equilibrium and how does that line up with the data, that kind of thing. Um, that's what I thought I would be doing, uh, but I've always had this interest in race and inequality. And I found myself uh, after being out of uh, graduate school, just a couple of three years, beginning to read the newspapers and magazines and follow the political debates and, uh, you know, reading outside of my discipline, reading in politics and history and philosophy and uh, even in the humanities and uh, literature and whatnot, reading the New York Review of Books and the New Republic magazine and the Atlantic Monthly and, and so on and following these debates. Um, and uh, I had opinions about the things that people were talking about, especially I was at Northwestern, that was my first job. I came back to Northwestern where I'd been an undergraduate right after graduate school as an assistant professor. And after a few years, I moved to the University of Michigan uh, with tenure uh, in the economics department there. Uh, and I was there in the end of the 1970s and into the early 1980s as an associate professor at the University of Michigan. And I was observing what was going on in Detroit uh, with just a few miles down the road from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And started to develop critical arguments about the civil rights uh, framework for addressing the problems of, of, of inequality and marginality of, that afflicted uh, the especially lower classes in the black community in the urban concentrated poverty uh, inner city neighborhoods and so on. Um, and I, and I was also being influenced by the currents in economic policy world at that time of supply side economics and uh, really a, a kind of uh, conservative criticism of the welfare state. Uh, and it may surprise you to hear this coming from an African-American economist and someone who came up on the South side of Chicago, but I actually had a lot of sympathy for the 
conservative critiques for the concerns about welfare dependency, um, for uh, a uh, worry about the social fiber of the low income uh, African-American population about uh, marital instability, about crime and violence, about school failure, low attachment to the workforce and things of this kind, and worrying that the institutional framework elaborated out of the Great Society, which was an extension of the FDR, this was a new deal and a great society, and the government was going to, you know, affect the redistribution resources that was adequate to uh, address the poverty problem that that might be well intended, but uh, there could be consequences of that that were deleterious and so on. So I, these kinds of thoughts were creeping into my head. Uh, I was listening to the rhetoric uh, from the, uh, the politicians at the local and the federal level of, uh, representing these communities uh, how they conceived of what was uh, uh, the uh, what were the failures and what needed to be done, and I couldn't suppress the thought: uh, the civil rights movement is over. That it, it was a phenomenon of the fifties and sixties. These are not civil rights problems. These are problems that have a lot to do with the behavior of people in the communities themselves, and that we needed a we needed to take into account the supply side of the labor market as well as the demand side of the labor market. It wasn't all about discrimination and racism. Some of it was about skill acquisition and, and about uh, patterns of behavior, about norms and values. And uh, these thoughts uh, really, I couldn't get them out of my head and I started writing about it. I started writing, I think my first popular piece, my first piece in a magazine was a speech that I gave during a Black History Month uh, event at Hillsdale College in like 1981, something like that. And I had this race and responsibility is what it was called. And I basically said along the lines of what I just said to you now, which is we can talk about uh, white racism and discrimination all we want and those things need to be opposed. But we also have to look at what's going on within our own community, I began to say. And we have to recognize that some problems, you know, it's you, you don't just wave a wand and you solve them. You, you don't just throw money at them. They, they, are, uh, they are very much more difficult than that. Um, it was published in Vital Speeches of the Day uh, shortly thereafter. And not too much fanfare. Uh, I showed it to one of my colleagues at Michigan. And he took me aside and he said, Glenn, you know, there's an idea too in here. I, I see where you're coming from, but you got to be really careful, you know, going around talking like that. You know, people are going to think you're a conservative if you don't watch out. Um, he said, you know, uh, maybe it's best if you don't publish pieces like this and just keep, you know, focused on your technical work. But uh, I didn't think that was good advice. I thought I needed to, to follow my uh, thinking uh, wherever it might lead. And I mean, I wanted to be factual. I wanted to be grounded in, in research and, and uh, you know, a good uh, rigorous uh, analysis. But uh, I, I, I thought if I had a critical uh, observation to make, I, 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 really should, I really should make it. And that started me in this uh, vein of uh, doing this two track, kind of uh, intellectual life of wanting to get my papers into the American Economic Review or the Review of Economic Studies or whatever it might be and continuing to turn out research of that kind, but also reading more broadly and writing and speaking in a, to general audiences about these matters and being a Black economist and if I may say so, one of the relatively few who are operating at the upper levels of uh, our profession more now, of course, than it was 30 or 40 years ago, um, I felt like I had something of an obligation uh, to, to address myself to these uh, broader themes. And so I have done. Yeah, well, awesome. I mean, and I think your answer illustrates why you're compared to Milton Friedman, because it's a very unique, a unique person that does both things well, and you do both things well. And I think, I think it's important, though, that we need more people like you because um again we we write these papers that go up in an academic journal and you know whatever 100 people read it or something like that and then the public doesn't 
gain from the knowledge, I mean, as much from the knowledge as they could when you share it the way that you've done. So that's awesome. Um, the, I think your answer also is a good segue. The, the next thing I wanted to ask you about is that your most, I mean, obviously you've done research in a wide variety of areas as we've already talked about, but your most known, especially as a public intellectual for your work in race and inequality, and you've studied it in your entire career. So I'd like to ask you some, some questions about your research and, and insights that you have on race and inequality. Um, so, so starting with, um, I know that um, in your dissertation, in fact, in 1976, um, one of your essays, you're, you're the first person that coined the term social capital, and you alluded to some of this in your previous answer, but you talked about the important role that social capital and social stratification can play in continuing racial inequality. So I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about some of your insights um, in that that area that you made, and then their continued relevance today? So why why does uh, so how can social capital and um, social stratification play a role in continuing racial inequality? Sure, uh, I was lucky in that I used the term social capital. Uh, before it had gotten wide currency. It had been in, invoked before. Jane Jacobs, uh, the writer about cities, the economy of cities, Jane Jacobs had actually used that term in one of her books. Oh. Um, but it was uh, the great sociologist, uh, Jim Coleman at University of Chicago and uh, the great political, now dead, but uh, uh, writing at the time his book, Foundations of Social Theory uh, has a chapter on social capital where he uh, credits me with having introduced the idea into the social sciences. And Robert Putnam, the political scientist, whose book Bowling Alone was very uh, influential, uh, for, uh, published maybe 25 years ago, but he also uh, developed this concept in his work and gives me credit for having been a progenitor. But I I can't take too much credit because I didn't really do any, you know, foundational social science research uh, in this vein. I, I merely, I had a theory, I had a framework and I used the phrase and the framework came out of uh, my dissertation where the question I put for myself was, if you had a history of discrimination, you had races, you had these racial groups and uh, you got a dynamic, system. So this multi-generational overlapping generations. So people acquire training in their youth and then they go into the labor market in their adulthood and they make it a wage which depends on the training that they acquired in their youth. Um, uh, but they belong to these racial groups. And if history had been unfair to one of the groups had been discriminatory, so they didn't get the same wage for the equal productivity. So they started out behind. And you had a regime change where the discrimination was eliminated by law. What would you expect to be the dynamic trajectory of inequality between the groups? And would you expect convergence uh, over time? You know, you could make arguments about diminishing returns to human capital investment that would imply that if you even started with groups with different initial conditions and you had some intergenerational influence. So if parents were poor, it was harder for the kid to get human capital. So the kid would be a little bit poor. But as long as the market was treating all factors, regardless of race, equally, maybe you would expect that you would eventually get convergence of the incomes. You could make an argument like that. Um, and I, I was interested in whether or not that would be true and under what conditions would it be true. And, and what I argued in my dissertation was that if there is not an important non-traded sphere of social influence that affects human capital acquisition, if there's not, there are not those kinds of spillovers that are socially mediated, that are based on relationships, based on who, who are you connected to, who's in your neighborhood, where do you get your information, uh, who, who can do favors for you and open doors for you. Um, if, if that's absent and if everything is on the table to be traded that's relevant to productivity at equal prices, then in my model, 
the disparity that history had generated between the economic condition of the racial groups would eventually diminish and go away. But if there existed some kind of social segregation that was outside the realm of economic transactions, for example, assortative mating patterns or residential segregation in neighborhood that was the consequences of the freely expressed choices about where people wanted to live when it sorted itself out in the, in the spatial uh, equilibrium market, you ended up with clusters of people of like race uh, who were uh, neighbors to one another in physical proximity. Um, or uh, the, that kind of thing where you had social relationships that carried spillovers in the uh, human capital acquisition process. So if you're connected to people who are getting a lot of education, that made it easier for you to get a lot of education, this kind of thing. Then a historically engendered disparity in economic position between the groups could persist. It could persist indefinitely. I showed it in an example in my thesis. This is a formal mathematical model. So it's it's all kind of, you know, there are assumptions and uh, functional form and all that, but I, I was able to illustrate the observation that you wouldn't necessarily get convergence if you had these so, this social uh, effect. So that's what I meant by social capital. I said, you have human capital, which we know from Gary Becker and uh, the Chicago people and Ted Schultz and uh, Jacob Mincer and all these people. You had uh, uh, a relationship between the work experience, the education, the skills and training, the health, which were things that people could invest in and it made them more productive. And you could see that in their remuneration in the labor market. You could measure the return to human capital. But you also had what I was calling social capital, which was the benefit or impediment of being located in terms of social relationships within a network in a place where your uh, neighboring adjacent nodes were not themselves investors, and that made it more difficult for you to become an investor. And those kind of, that kind of clustering could lead to persistent group inequality. Uh, I, I know I took a while to say that, and it may not have been as clear as I would like it to have been, but but that was the idea that I was working on. Yeah, so so given given that idea, so given the idea that there you know there's still is a tendency for people to cluster together the way you're talking about you know with with like groups or people that look alike are there is there a role i mean so this might say some people may say well then <laughs> non-discrimination policy is not enough to get rid of and you've made this point in the past not a writ enough to get rid of these disparities and so so that might lead somebody to say well then we should have racial preferences and in, in hiring or school admissions but then you've also made the point that 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 can disincentivize minorities from investing in the skills that are going to be valuable in the marketplace and so in your view is there a role for some kind of racial preferences in hiring or or school admissions well my views have changed yeah if you pick up that 1976 1976 my god that was what was that that was 47 years ago uh, if you pick up that dissertation You'll find in my concluding uh, remarks in that uh, paper that uh, I think that was what I showed. I think what I showed was laissez-faire was insufficient. That leaving, you know, just leveling the playing field, having had a history of an unlevel playing field, just leveling the playing field wouldn't do the trick. That you would have persistent inequality. Uh, so I advocated for some kind of intervention. It, it was early in the mid-70s, late 70s. It was relatively early in the career of affirmative action, racial preferences. They were in play, uh, but those cases were just beginning to come to the court. I think the Baki case is 1978, if I'm not mistaken. That's two years after I finished my dissertation. But affirmative action certainly was in the works uh, in those years, and I was all for it. Uh, less uh, prominent in the uh, conversation was the issue of reparations as some kind of payment to the descendants of slaves. Uh, but if it had been on the table, I think I probably would have been for that too in 1976. 
1976 was just a decade after the height of the civil rights movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, Martin Luther King Jr. He's assassinated in 1968. It's 1976. We were relatively early in the in the history of trying to make uh, amends and redress and rectify and uh, deal with the consequences of segregation, discrimination, and uh, anti-Black uh, unequal opportunity. But we're now in the year 2023, and a long time has gone by, and the country has changed a lot. And I don't have the same enthusiasm as I did as a young man for uh, racial preferences and rep racially defined reparations as a remedy for uh, the problem. And I could say why. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about this at length. But the, the basic uh, point of view that I take now is we have to think about the country. We can't just think about Black people. We have to think about what's healthy for our society. And creating a state of exception from the liberal order of treating individuals on the merits, regardless of their identity, is a very bad thing for us to do as a permanent and institutionalized practice going forward. You might be able to make a transition argument that as a part of some intergenerational long-term strategy, we might have allowed ourselves to be uh, corrupted, I, I almost want to say, a bit by engaging in this practice. What practices am I talking about? I'm talking about you're selecting elites, you're rationing, you're rationing access to elite venues of performance in whatever the field might be. Let's make it academic performance. And so you have criteria like test scores and grades and letters of recommendation and other demonstrated competencies. And you have a heterogeneous population of aspirants, people who would like to pursue the scarce opportunity, different by race and gender and sexual orientation and so forth and so on. You want diversity amongst those who are selected, but you're rationing access to an elite by definition. Not everyone in the population is capable of performing in the same way at this activity. That's why you have test scores and grades and other criteria to select. You are looking for the most talented, the most qualified, the most meritorious of persons. So that's the regime. That's, that's the problem that we're, the situation that we're in. To bring into that situation, when you have racial disparities of preparation, racial differences of development, racial inequality of acquired functioning ability. When you have that, now history has given you that, it might not be fair. The reason for it don't have to be in the intrinsic genetic endowment of the populations in question. There are myriad reasons why it might be so, but that's the case. The case is that there's a big difference in the <clears throat> distribution of performance on the instruments of assessment of acquired ability at this particular task by race. There's a big racial difference. You have that. That's a fact. To, to build into that situation a practice, an institutionalized practice of judging the applicants from the different racial groups by different criteria is, I think, very bad for the society. I also think it's bad at the end of the day, even for the beneficiaries of the practice, and I can say more why, but I've come to think that that's not what we want to do in an ongoing basis. And now, it's a half century down the line, I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's time to reassess this practice rather than to double down on it, which is what a lot of people want to do. Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, no, uh, excellent. So so I, I have a question then of, related to just the acquisition of or the importance of social capital and then the network that you're surrounded with. So school quality obviously plays an important role in acquisition of skills that are valued in the marketplace. So, so how do you feel about 
it, do you think that having like widespread school choice legislation like a universal voucher system or something like that has the potential to reduce racial disparities yes um, there are people who study this seriously and i'm not going to pretend to be one of them i mean who will give you chapter and verse and uh the data on uh school choice uh, as a policy, I, it, it's not something that I'm going to be able to get very granular about. So I'm going to operate in, in the spirit of uh, the great Milton Friedman on first principles. It's a public good that's being provided by a unionized workforce that has its own interests. Those interests are not the interests of the families and the children who are dependent upon the provision of the service. <laughs> uh, this will not be the only venue of American public life in which that kind of conflict arises between the organized labor on the one side and those who are dependent on the service delivery on the other. Policing is another example where the unions are active and influence the outcome in ways that we might be critical of. We might think that they're overly protective of police officers who deserve to be able to be held accountable for this, the way in which they carry themselves and so forth. And police unions can be a problem. Um, and I must say, I, I will say, people who are working, I'm, I'm not going to declare a priori that public employee unions are just across the board wrong or bad. I don't necessarily think that people have a right to organize. But that's the situation that we have. And if the services that are being delivered are, are not as good as alternative uh, that, uh, services that could be acquired by the families in question, um, I have a hard time seeing why not allow them to exercise that kind of a choice. Now, the counter argument is, well, it's a system. Not everyone is equally situated, and there'll be a kind of selective out-migration of the most resourceful families if uh, leaving the public schools as, the, as it were, the educator of last resort with uh, the, the very difficult task of trying to educate with uh, relatively limited resources or more diminished resources because they will have lost a lot of their, a lot of their uh, uh, subscribers who will vote with their feet. And uh, that, that's, that's where the argument kind of lies now. Um, but I would say let a thousand flowers bloom. I, I would say experiment. I would say, especially in the urban systems that where the scores are abysmal and the uh, kids who are uh, uh, functioning at basic uh, level of proficiency in uh, reading and mathematics are so low as assessed by the various, you know, national assessment of educational progress and so on. Um, I would say open things up, even though I know that uh, that will uh, be an extremely controversial position. Yeah. So Let my people go. That, that, <laughs> that's what I've been given to say when I'm doing public events on it. Let my people go. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, so we, I, we had a, that brings up, but we recently had Ian Rowe here, uh, who's doing a great job with, with a, a charter school in, in New York city. And yeah. I mean, that's a really good example. He cites, you know, the statistics on, um, success rate at, you know, his charter school relative to in the public schools. And I think it's a good example of, of, you know, how that can be beneficial. And so speaking of Ian Rowe, he, he talks about the invisible man, the, the fact that stories of successful black men are oftentimes not told in the public narrative. And I know that you're a contributor to Robert Woodson's uh, 1776 Unites project, which part of the goal of that project is to highlight successful African Americans. Um, and so I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about the 1776 Unites project? Give us a little bit more insight into what that project is about and what your role is in that project. Well, I'm an academic advisor, uh, so to speak. I don't have a formal title, but that's the role that I'm playing. There's a group of us, he calls us scholars, uh, whom he, uh, this is Robert Woodson, who is the president, the founder and the president of the Woodson Center in Washington, D.C., which previously had been called the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. 
um, that's been at it for 40 years plus, uh, trying to promote uh, empowerment and self-development in uh, the low-income communities around the country, housing projects and high violence neighborhoods and communities and so on. He has a number of different initiatives to that effect. But after the sensational uh, impact of the um, of the 1619 Project's uh, effort at the New York Times and the controversy that broke out uh, around the 1619 Project, 1619 Project wanted to center the narrative of American history around slavery, 1619 being the year uh, when enslaved persons were landed in Virginia, uh, could be taken as the beginning of slavery in America. There's historians have some controversy about that, but be that as it may, the point is to say that the struggle of the Negro, of the enslaved person, of the Black, to gain equal citizenship and dignity and standing within the American framework <laughs> is the central theme for the, the to, to telling the, the story of the country. And um, uh, some of us, were not entirely persuaded by this uh, uh, effort to rewrite the uh, historical narrative. I don't want to get into the details about you know what's right or wrong about the 1619 project. Uh, I, I just want to say the idea that um, the uh, story of African Americans is mainly a story of suppression, domination, enslavement, unfairness and that the story of the country is mainly a story of a failure to live up to the ideals of its founding and a perpetuation of a white male dominated capitalist uh, uh, anti-native uh, uh, you know bandit society I, I put this in, the, in hyperbolic terms I realize but this is the kind of impression that you can get from reading through the 1619 Project materials, we didn't think that that was the right story about our country. This is Robert Woodson, this is Glenn Lowry, this is a number of others who are associated with this effort, um, and wanted to basically give a forceful, clear-eyed, uh, alternative account about the history of uh, African Americans and the history of the United States of America. I mean, one of the things uh, that we wanted to emphasize is the triumphs and the successes uh, that characterize African-American history. Um, the acquisition of literacy by the freedmen after the emancipation, for example, uh, the acquisition of land, the development of a, of a yeoman farming class and so on. Uh, the the uh, ability of us to acquire property, to develop our families, uh, this kind of thing. We want to put a positive face to some degree on what it is that Black people were and can do for ourselves um, in this great country. And I would add to that, we wanted to recognize that uh, while slavery was, of course, an abomination uh, and a blight and inconsistent with the ideals of the declaration uh, and so on. Uh, in the fullness of time, slavery was eradicated in the United States. You have to reckon also with emancipation if you want to tell this story. There were 600,000 bodies left strewn across battlefields in the course of the four years between 1861 and 1865, the Civil War, the war between the states that led to the emancipation of the slaves. Um, and <laughs> yes, uh, there was uh, a long uh, period after the emancipation, excuse me, in which uh, equal rights were not extended to African American, equal citizenship rights were not extended that had to be won through struggle. The fact is that that struggle did ensue. Um, and uh, through the second third of the 20th century, we saw a revolution in the status of African Americans at law within the framework of the American Republic. And there's just a different way of telling the history, a way that is more uh, compatible with a recognition of the greatness of American civilization. Again, I know that that may sound uh, corny uh, to some people, but I think it's very important 
uh, to recognize uh, the, the tremendous achievements of American civilization, uh, as well as to call attention to its, uh, to its flaws. So something like that, John. Yeah, excellent. So, okay, no, one, I want to ask one more question about uh, race and inequality. And so this is a, a, you've done a lot of research in your career and writing about mass incarceration. And so you've noted the disparities in the number of people that are incarcerated in the United States in comparison to other countries. And you've also noted the disproportionate number of black men that are incarcerated relative to others in the United States. And you note that people, we need to recognize that people have agency and they should be held accountable for their actions. But you also note that uh, we overly rely on a punitive criminal justice system to deal with social dysfunction rather than building human capital or building skills in, in uh, communities, human development so that we can prevent the crimes in the first place so that that lead to the incarceration. So I'm wondering what kinds of thoughts do you have on how can we reform our criminal justice system without resorting to something like defund the police or something like that? Yeah. Um, so the, I, I gave some lectures at Stanford in 2007, the Tanner Lectures on Human Values uh, race, Incarceration, and American Values was the title I used, and uh, the lectures were published as a small book by MIT Press. Um, and the, the key distinction that I was trying to emphasize in those lectures was that between personal or individual responsibility, so a lawbreaker commits a crime, there to be held accountable for that act. Uh, and they get due process, and then there is uh, punishment. And it, that that is uh, a central uh, element of the maintenance of, of order in, a, in civil society. People have to be responsible for their actions. But I distinguish between that and uh, collectively or social responsibility for that we as a whole, as a community, as a political community, uh, have for designing in our institutions in such a manner as to affirm the, the, the humanity of all of our people and to try to extend opportunity to all of our people. Uh, so, I mean, take something like uh, drugs, drug trafficking, illicit drug trafficking. So there's, a, there's demand and supply. People want to use these substances that we've decided as a society to outlaw, uh, and uh, they they constitute a market. And then there's a black market of you know supply of, of people who are responding to uh, to the desire to consume these substances. Now that's a large social phenomenon. That, that there will be individual lawbreakers who end up you know, carrying weapons and committing violent acts and engaging in illicit commerce and uh, whatnot. And we have law. And when we find people who have broken the law, we need to hold them accountable. I, I don't suggest that we do anything other than that. But if in the course of doing so, we were to see patterns in which there were large numbers of, you know, people from particular communities who are getting caught up in this traffic, we might begin to ask ourselves, you know, how does the market work and where does it ultimately come from? And uh, we might see then that the individual wrongful acts of these lawbreakers was embedded within a, a, a structure or a framework which was also amenable to our uh, policy and to our intervention. And to leave it only on individual, punishing individual wrongdoers and never stepping back and asking ourselves whether or not there are other ways in which we could respond uh, to the situation that were uh, uh, more uh, affirmative and 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 more uh, uh, positive in terms of the development of the of people involved. I, I hesitate here because I, I I know what this could sound like. It could sound like, oh well, we don't go after the root causes of crime. And that's so much easier to say than it is to actually do. It, it's not at all clear whether and to what extent the 
various uh, social policy efforts that are aimed at root causes really can be counted upon to have the effects of, of, of reducing crime. Uh, but uh, it's a thought, it seems to me, that should never uh, completely uh, leave the discussion. It, it's not enough simply to hold individuals accountable and uh, uh, I, the importance of that point is what I was trying to develop in those lectures all those years ago, 2007. Okay, awesome. So so I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you a few different questions. And, and I have a whole long list of questions that I'm not going to be able to ask you all of them because uh, we want to make sure we let the uh, audience ask questions as well. But I want to ask you about it. I know that you've uh, taught a course at, at Brown called Free Inquiry in the Modern World. And I know that viewpoint diversity is something that you've talked about before. And so I just, we did a survey at the Chali Institute of college students nationwide, 2000 college students nationwide, none of them at NDSU, but, but we asked them uh, a series of questions on their opinions on viewpoint diversity and two questions, the answers to two questions really stand out. And one was, if a professor says something that you that students deem to be offensive, should that professor be reported to the university? 74% of students said yes, they should be reported. Um, and then the other question was, if a student says something that other students deem to be offensive, should the student be reported to the university? Two thirds of the students said yes, they should. So the first question I have is, do those results surprise you at all? Sadly, no, they don't. Okay. So I, is that I wouldn't have known the number, but uh, but the fact that it's two thirds or three quarters is not is not that surprising given the times in which we live. But they do frighten me. Those numbers don't surprise me, but they do they do terrify me. So so what's been the reaction on on your campus to by students and by faculty to to you teaching a class essentially on viewpoint diversity is that has there been a positive reaction from people well yeah no one's gotten uh, mad at me for offering the course and the kids who <laughs> I've taught it twice <clears throat> with the assistance of a very talented undergraduate teaching assistant uh, his name is David Sachs he's a student at Stanford Law now uh, but David and I uh, did a year-long independent reading course together, just the two of us, in which we read classical and contemporary works on uh, freedom of inquiry together and discussed them. And then we, we thought it was so rich uh, a subject area to explore that uh, we thought we could develop a course around that year-long reading that he and I did just one-on-one, -on -one, uh, which we did do, and we offered it twice with great success, seminar of 20, uh, so that's 40 alumni of the two years of offering the seminar. They are very happy about it. They loved it. We start with Plato, uh, the Apology of Socrates, uh, and the Allegory of the Cave. We, you know, and uh, we read John Milton, Areopagitica, uh, his uh, defense of uh, the open licensing of books. He didn't want the crown to get involved in the business of licensing what books and pamphlets could and could not be printed. And he has a very passionate and eloquent uh, argument to the effect that you should not be licensing books. Um, and uh, we read John Stuart Mill, of course, on liberty. Uh, but we read a lot of, we read essays like, uh, like uh, George Orwell, uh, the politics in the English language or Vaclav Havel, uh, the power of the powerless, where do the dissidents in Eastern Europe get their influence from? What's the foundation of that? Uh, we read Ella Alan Bloom's uh, The Closing of the American Mind, which was a 1980s uh, bestseller uh, in which he lamented the decline in the quality of intellectual life in American campuses. And, and then we did a, a bunch of contemporary cases of uh, people who found themselves running afoul of uh, the politically correct thought police for one reason or another. Um, and the students loved it. Now, I admit that that's not the majority view on campus. <clears throat> uh, free speech equals violence. 
You, you could find that bumper sticker um, <laughs> wrapped around a telephone pole walking across campus and stuff, stuff like that. Why are you weaponizing free speech? One of my colleagues, whom I'm not going to name, is given to using that formulation. You're weaponizing free speech. Uh, so uh, there's an argument that's ongoing, but uh, when my university president, um, Christina Paxson, an economist, after the George Floyd killing, uh, sent around a letter to all of the faculty, all of the students, and all of the alumni of the university, declaring the university to be on the side of um, virtue and, and, and justice, standing in the gap against anti-Black racism, and so on, and had that letter signed by two dozen of the top administrators of the university, the provost, the investment portfolio manager, the general counsel, the deans of all the various schools and colleges and so on. And uh, the letter was full of what I thought were very arguable propositions and it was tendentious. It, it was very much in the spirit of Black Lives Matter it was a letter of allyship, of we stand with you in your struggle. And I thought it was very inappropriate that the university should take as its official policy that kind of arguable position on a debatable set of issues without saying that I was against or for the position that was taken. I just thought it was entirely inappropriate. So I objected. I wrote a public letter of objection, which was published in the city journal uh, and drew quite a bit of attention uh, around the country of people who agreed with me that uh, university administration should not take the name of the university and use it to further political causes. It should be a forum, a university should be a place where we debate the ideas, not, not where we declare what the right side of history is and then pat ourselves on the back for standing on the right side of history. Um, I, for one, wasn't even sure that what happened between Derek Chauvin, the police officer whose knee stayed on George Floyd's neck for 11 minutes and 43 seconds, and George Floyd was a racial event. It, it was being interpreted as an act of racism. I wanted to know, why did, how did we reach that conclusion? How did it, how did it become symbolic and representative of the age-old struggle of African-Americans to uh, achieve equal citizenship in the country? White people end up in the same kind of situation with police in this country frequently. Um, anyway, I, I'm not trying to pick a fight with whoever might be listening to this because I know that this is a very contentious issue. My point is it's a very contentious issue that universities should be the referee uh, within the argument, not taking sides in the argument on, because there are multiple sides that are legitimate to bring the bear in this argument. Yeah. D did you receive support from other people at Brown for your rebuttal letter at all? A half dozen privately. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so you know, I, a handful. Yeah. Uh, I, I unfortunately, I, I mean, not unfortunately, we want to give time for the, the audience to ask questions. So I want to ask you one more question first. So, so, so I, I love, I just want to ask you a question about your show. I love listening to your show. And I know a lot of people love listening to your show, the Glenn show. So I'll do an ad for your show why, or listen to, and you can watch even the Glenn show. Um, and also feel free to plug your book because I didn't get a chance to ask you a question about your autobiography, but um, I do. One of the things I think one of the reasons why people like listening to your show is that I think you're very unique among podcast hosts. And I'll say three things that stand out in my mind. One is that one thing I <coughs> notice very much so is that you genuinely listen to and consider the arguments of your guests, even when those arguments are from somebody that maybe you disagree with. So I'll give an example. You had Richard Wolf, a Marxist economist, on your show recently. And so Clearly, you're not a Marxist economist, but you are willing to listen to and consider his arguments. Um, second thing is that you're not afraid to state your opinions, even when your opinions may not be popular opinions. And you talked about writing your rebuttal letter as an example of that. And um, third is that you treat all of your guests with respect. And so 
I think the reason why people love your show and why I do is that those kinds of conversations that you have on your show, and I think the kind of conversation we're having now are the kinds of conversations that people want more of in our country is so polarized. And so do you have advice for us on how can we have meaningful conversations with other people that we disagree with? Well, I think you outlined some of what I think are the necessary ingredients. Uh, listening is really very important. <laughs> you know, uh, hearing hearing uh, people out. And I, I even do this thing of where I try to say, let me see if I can say what you just said in my own words kind of thing, you know, to, to see if I'm really getting it, what the argument is. Before, I then go on to say, well, here, let me give you a three-point rebuttal of what it is that I now understand you to be saying. Yeah. So, so listening to mutual respect, <clears throat> avoiding ad hominem, that this is, you know, what kind of person would make that kind of an argument, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> attitude? You're a bad person because you have this position on the transgender uh, uh, debate, uh, you know, participation in female athletics. And, you know, and, and so you, you, want them, you want to kill, you want them to die. Uh, Matt Taibbi, you know, Matt Taibbi, the journalist is uh, doing the Twitter files thing. Mm -hmm. He has a book called Hate Inc. in which he gives his analysis of what's gone wrong with American journalism. And he calls it everybody who doesn't agree with me is Hitler. You know, this this kind of this attitude of, you know, <laughs> that's the extreme of ad hominem. You, you must be a racist if you question affirmative action. Yeah. You know, that is such an easy move to make. And, and it's a it's a power move when people make it an argument when a kid. That's why I don't like that statistic that you cited, although I believe it. If I say in a classroom that. Uh, if you cared about black lives, you would worry about the level of criminal violence in the black communities and cite the. Over 10,000 homicides last year of Black people killing other Black people, et cetera. And the student is offended by that. And they report me <laughs> for having said that. That's horrible. I mean, first of all, the chilling effect. I'll be very, very careful to say anything if I think I'm going to get reported. But also, what am I doing to this young person? by teaching them that the way to respond to a disquieting argument is to start crying. In effect, it is to claim injury. Yeah. Your argument hurt me. That's terrible. But in a university, that's terrible. You're not doing them any favors. Equip them to make a counter argument. Yeah. That, that, that seems to me to be the only way to do that with integrity to the purpose of the institution empower the person to be able to defend themselves against ideas with better ideas. <clears throat> so I'm, I didn't answer your question. Your question was, how do we promote, you know, better conversation across the board? I gave a description of the things that I think contribute to having that conversation, but how do I get people to actually do that? I don't know. Yeah, but but it's an excellent point you make about equip people to to make the the argument because it's a lot easier to just attack the person than to to actually make it. It means you probably had, don't have a good argument if you attack the other person. You you can't think of a good argument. So that's an excellent. I point. tell you it's something I think I'm going to do in my seminar. I'm teaching a seminar on race and inequality to first year students. I'm going to get them to in the first half of the class argue one side you know, divide the room. They have to argue one side and then the other has to argue the other side. You, you can't say anything that's not in support or not, you know. And then in the second half, get them to switch and then make them, you know, uh, go over to argue the other side of the very issue that they, you know. That's, that's so they a should be able to argue both sides of every issue. That's that's a great idea. So, yeah, so let's, so let's turn to the Louise and see if, uh, uh, if there's somebody has a question up in the Louise and then if uh, okay, so Vishan. Can you hear me? Oh. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, good to see you, Professor Lowry. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, really like your sweater, too. Um, ah, thank you. So um, 
I had a lot of questions, but um, you covered most of them. So um, my only question I have is, um, you've been a public intellectual for this many years. Have you changed your opinion uh, about a particular topic um, that you've, you know, held passionately, like you've had a strong position and um, given the data and evidence and whatnot, you've, you know, changed your position? Well, yes, affirmative action, uh, as we were discussing, as I was discussing with John, is one of those issues uh, on which I have changed my, uh, on which I have changed my position. I, I've also changed my position on the incarceration question. In 2007, when I gave those lectures that I mentioned, and I published that small book, Race, Incarceration, and American Values, I was on a mission to decry the injustice of the American incarceration system. And I had a, a very good friend, the late a great political scientist, James Q. Wilson, uh, was a friend of mine. I worked with him uh, for years when I was at Harvard. And uh, we collaborated when uh, at the National Research Council's Committee on Law and Justice, which is a committee of the National Academy of Sciences research arm that looks into criminal justice questions. And I served on that committee and Jim was chairman of that committee. We were friends, we were good friends. And, um, but Jim was a hawk uh, on incarceration issues. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, Crime and Human Nature with Richard Herrnstein, in which he was exploring the uh, biological and genetic uh, foundations of certain kinds of aggressive behavior. Uh, Thinking About Crime was his collection of essays that was published in, I think, the late 1970s that argued for uh, the position that we were not holding enough people in prison that uh, our uh, incentives were all uh, out of line for uh, the deterrence of law breaking. Jim was a hawk, uh, broken windows policing was one of the things that he uh, advocated for and so on. Anyway, he and I fell out. We had a public disagreement. The Cato uh, Unbound uh, web magazine has an issue circa 2011 or so in which uh, I have an essay saying there are way too many people in prison and way, way too many Black people in prison. And Jim has a response to that essay saying if they didn't commit as many crimes, we wouldn't have to put them in prison. And I'd be happy to talk to you about the Black family if you're willing to talk about it, but that's the root of the problem. And I was very, very angry with him. I know I'm taking a minute here and answering, but here I'll just get to the point about how I changed my mind. So. Um, Unfortunately, uh, Jim Wilson dies. Uh, I think the year is 2013, it might be 2014. And I write an intellectual obituary in which I blast him. I say he died with blood on his hands. In effect, I say, I don't, not quite those words. He died with much to answer for the words that I actually use. But in effect, I said that he was responsible for too many people going to prison and uh, his ideas were, were dangerous. And it was published in the Boston Review, which is a reasonably prominent uh, platform. Me attacking this man who had died uh, and was no longer able to answer for himself. And, and you know, it was not, it was not my best moment, I, I fear. And okay, I say all that to say, and then uh, Michael Brown happens and Freddie Gray happens and ultimately George Floyd happens. And we get a lot of stuff, including ultimately the summer of 2020, which I think was a disaster for our country and for the black communities that are so troubled by our, our crime. And then we get the deep policing reaction uh, to this and we get this bombastic uh, 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 ideological uh, uh, exaggeration of the threat which policing is said to pose to uh, the integrity of black lives. And I find myself shaking my head, wondering how I could ever have been uh, as uh, contemptuous of the, in retrospect, clear headed and balanced uh, approach to these issues that someone like James Q. Wilson represented. And I've spent the last three or four years really uh, atoning in the essays that I've been writing in public statements that I've been making about this issue for, uh, for the excesses. So I changed my mind about affirmative action. I used to be for it, now I'm against it. 
and I've changed my mind about criminal justice issues. I used to be deeply concerned about the structural racism of the American criminal justice system. And I'm now uh, uh, concerned deeply about the consequences of violent criminal behavior for people who are uh, uh, dependent upon uh, the maintenance of order by the forces of civil authority, which are being uh, attacked at every turn. Hold on, I have to take this call. No, I can't take it. So anyway, I apologize, John. That's okay. uh, I'm having a I'm having a few people over to my house uh, after this event, and one of them just was trying to call me, so I can't oh. take the call. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll let it wait. They're due here at seven, and this event's going to end at six thirty, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my apologies to the to the questioner for that interruption. Oh, that no, that's okay. That's good answer. So we we have. Uh, I'm going to ask. The, uh, a question, one of the online questions, and I'll ask them in the order that they were, they came in. And then if somebody else has a question in the Louise, please step forward too. Um, so the first question is, uh, how would you say growing up as a black man in this time really defined your future or how it made you grow? Oh, well, it, it, I, you know, I'm writing the autobiography. I've been thinking a lot about this. It, it shaped me in, in very profound ways. I mean, after all, I was, I was a young father. I was a father at the age of 18. And I, I was a, a college dropout. And um, I, I lived within a community in which that was not uncommon. Uh, on the other hand, I had a lot of support and a lot of encouragement. Um, of course, I faced the discrimination and the barriers that uh, people of color have faced in the course of American history, but I also had tremendous opportunity uh, and a lot of encouragement from uh, my teachers and, and the institutions that nurtured me. Um, be being Black, I think, is probably the reason why I have made the study of race and inequality such an important part of my overall intellectual portfolio. Um, doors have been opened uh, in part because institutions have wanted diversity. I was the first black to receive tenure in the economics department at Harvard University when I went there in 1982. And I'm sure being black was part of the reason that that appointment was extended to me because they were trying to build up their faculty in their Afro-American studies department where I had a joint appointment. Uh, but it's also confronted me with uh, the need to overcome people's expectations, maybe the stereotypes that uh, attend uh, when people see you and all they see is the color of your skin. I could tell many stories. One of them, I'm invited to be the keynote speaker at an event in Washington, D.C. that's taking place up on the top floor of a fancy building. And I, I get in the elevator and they have a greeter to greet people when they get off the elevator and I come and it's a hot day and I'm not entirely comfortable and I'm looking for the men's room. And uh, I'm the guest of honor. I'm, I, I'm actually the person who's going to be up there at the podium giving the speech and the attendant ignores me and is uh, going over to the other people and I can't barely get her attention because she doesn't realize that I'm really an important person. She thinks I've just, you know, come to deliver the groceries or something. Uh, that kind of thing happens. Uh, but uh, on the whole, I've, uh, speaking for myself, I've uh, had nothing but one opportunity after another to develop my potential from these uh, great institutions that I've been privileged to be educated at uh, and to be on the faculty of. Um, so that's how I would respond to that question. If there's more people in the Louise with questions, please step up to the podium. Um, otherwise, okay, I'll start with a, another question that came in online here. So it says, you seem to assume, this is a long question I, I can tell looking at it. So it says, you seem to assume that US society is a near pure meritocracy. Resources are clearly not evenly or fairly distributed. How do you account for the institutional policies that benefit or favor the social financial elite to the disadvantage of middle or lower income people of color. For example, legacy admissions in elite universities. Should those inequities be identified and eliminated? 
Sure. Um, I don't assume that it, everything is, uh, you know, hunky dory. That's a completely level playing field. I know that nepotism and favoritism exists, and the legacy admissions is one example of that. Uh, and I'm against that. Um, so uh, I guess I'm going to argue against the premise of the question to that extent. Uh, I'd say about the uh, legacy admission, I know why institutions do it. They're trying to cultivate relationships with family lines, which they think will redound to their financial benefit because the loyalties that are built up uh, lead to donations back to the university. And they could argue, well, that allows us to be able to fund, you know, uh, scholarships for kids who can't afford to pay tuition and so on. But uh, I would not, uh, you know, go to the mat uh, trying to defend this particular institution building strategy uh, if it were to come under attack, uh, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a fan of legacy admissions. And by the way, it's not just legacy; it's also athletes and and so on. But uh, I don't think two wrongs make a right. Uh, is the way that I would answer that. While we, the questioner and I, might agree that legacy admissions is a kind of nepotism, it, it's a kind of non-level playing field. I, I certainly agree with that. It's not, the fact of it is not an argument for affirmative action. We, I, th I think those are distinct arguments. Uh, and um, I've already indicated why in the year 2023, um, I'm, I'm very concerned about perpetuating the practice of judging applicants who, who are uh, competing for selective uh, uh, admissions by different standards. Um, so, um, yeah, that's how I would respond to that question. Okay, thanks. And, and so we have a, looks like we have a question in the Louise. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, Professor Loy, thank you very much for uh, being here and talking with us. Um, I have a question. Um, in North Dakota, there aren't any, really any big cities, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about the power mostly destructive of the big city um, um, school, uh, public school establishment, the teachers unions. Um, I spent about 15 years most taught, reading, writing about education, mostly in Harlem and South Bronx, um, and interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people who grew up like you did on the south side of Chicago. Uh, and the people who are successful had were either old enough that they'd gone to uh, public school before unionization, or had perhaps you know grown up in a suburb, or most of them actually had gone to a Catholic school in in uh, in Harlem or the South Bronx. What very few that became successful in any manner in any measure had done was go to a public school, um, a big city public school in the last several decades, and um, uh, you know so I was writing about schools that were spending five thousand dollars a year like a Catholic school versus $25,000 at a public school for completely opposite results. And um, perhaps, you know, for the benefit of people here, talk a little bit about the power of the teachers unions that that uh, crushes um, educational innovations and and the things that would work and used to work at, at public schools in, in African-American and Hispanic neighborhoods. Um, and now, you know, now they're, you know, education deserts basically. Well, you said it. I mean, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add. I could say that I agree that on the whole, uh, the big city public schools are failing uh, their their charges. Um, that I think the overly bureaucratized and uh, employee protective policies uh, that are put in place and supported and enforced through unionization is a big reason why. And that the best response to that is to allow for the public resources that under underwrite it to be at the disposal of families that can then make choices about how to get their kids educated. Uh, that would uh, put competitive pressure to improve the quality of service delivery amongst the unionized sector. 
And it would also just expand the opportunities for education for the kids who could avail themselves of alternatives, including parochial uh, and, and uh, uh, private homeschooling, micro school. You know, there, there's a lot of different things that one could think about doing. So I, I, all I can say is I agree with the sentiment that you've expressed. I think you accurately described the, the phenomenon. Well, thank you. So uh, I'll go to another online question. So it says, uh, what are your thoughts about the Black Lives Matter movement? I'm not a big fan, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm sure most people who are involved, especially at the grassroots in these various cities and towns around the country are well-meaning. Uh, they are exercised about uh, police violence. There is police violence. Some of it is unnecessary. Oh, some of it is necessary. Some of it is unnecessary. Uh, so I don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, trying to oppose their impulse to speak out and to become active uh, on behalf of you know, as they understand it, the well-being of their community. But I think making the police the the uh, bad guy here is a mistake. Uh, again, there are bad police they need to be dealt with. Police should be held accountable when they break the law just like anybody else. They should be adequately trained. They should be sufficiently resourced, but they should treat everybody whom they encounter with the respect that a citizen is due when he encounters an officer of the state regardless of the circumstance. But the threat to black lives in America does not come mainly from the police. Uh, the root of the problem, in my opinion, is crime and violent crime being carried out by a relatively few, but sufficiently numerous that it constitutes a problem for everybody, people in these communities. Uh, so I think Black Lives Matter puts the ball in the wrong court. That's not even to get into the fine points of the ideology of the act of the particular activists who are prominent in promoting uh, Black Lives Matter. I don't think the nuclear family is a problem. I don't think capitalism is a problem. Uh, I think that queer women deserve to have every right that anybody else has, but they don't speak for me. So uh, the uh, celebration of Black Lives Matter as a re-instantiation of the civil rights movement uh, is absolutely wrong. The moral foundation of the civil rights movement, we talk about the long struggle that culminates in the bills in the mid 1960s and of which Martin Luther King Jr. is the iconic representative even to this day, has roots that go deep down into the foundation of the American Republic, politically, culturally, philosophically. Um, the Black Lives Matter enthusiasm is perhaps I'm just of the wrong generation. I'm 74 years old. Maybe I'm never going to understand it. They do not speak for me. Yeah, thanks. So we have we have time. Uh, I know that you have dinner guests coming and we have dinner guests that are upstairs in the Louise. So I want there's one question I want to ask you um, before we leave. And so so our Menard family speaker series, it, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to hear insights from world thought leaders like you about ways that we can improve the human condition and increase economic opportunity. But it's also a great way for our students to hear about the types of things that they can do to enhance their chances for future success. So I'm wondering, can you give some advice that you that you might have for, for our students? Study mathematics. That's a good one. <laughs> Pay attention to the math courses, to the statistics courses. Take hard stuff. Don't take easy stuff. Take it for a grade. Don't take it past no credit. I don't know if the University of uh, North Dakota permits that. But, uh, you know, challenge yourselves. This is a rare 
and uh, it won't be coming again opportunity in your life to actually grow and develop. Uh, challenge yourselves. Don't don't go easy on it. And uh, the technical stuff will be with you forever. So um, that's that's what I would say. That's awesome. Can you tell us how can we how are we going to be able to get your book? Is there is do you know when it's coming out? You're I do. And that's actually not even in production yet. I've just submitted the manuscript uh, to the editorial process at WW Norton. And uh, we have a, a, a tentative uh, publication date of April 2024. So it's it's early yet. And I regret that. But but uh, they tell me that that's how long it's going to take. But I have finished the draft uh, after 10 years of threatening to write this book. So there will be a book. It's coming. It's just going to be another year. If I buy one, will you autograph one for me? Absolutely. Sure. Okay, awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, thanks, thanks again for being here. This has been a great conversation, and I wish I could talk to you longer. This, is, this has been super fun, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I really... We really appreciate you being here and, and sharing your insights with us. This has been a really fun conversation. Thanks. Thanks again, Glenn. My pleasure, John. And thanks to the audience uh, for the questions and for your, your attention. Thank you. Yeah. And hopefully we can bring you here in person, maybe in June or something. It's, it's, we don't get snow in June. so <laughs> That sounds better. I don't teach in June either. Classes will be over by the end of May. So maybe we can work something out.